Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. If we take a step back from the day-to-day -day back and forth between the Biden and Trump campaigns, it's pretty clear that over the next few election cycles in this country, the most defining issue is going to be generational change and turnover. The silent generation and baby boomer generations represented by both presidents are no longer going to be in charge of everything from the presidency to the leadership in the House and Senate to the moralities and governorships across the country. So as rising generations, the Xers, millennials such as myself, and of course the Zoomers look to taking power, I think it's incredibly important that we look back to how previous generations met their own challenges so we can actually pick up the baton and not make the mistakes the previous ones made. With all that in mind, I had a really great conversation with Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, about the founding fathers. He has a new book out. It's called The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. Now, normally, I'm not really one for A, Revolutionary War history, but B, Political Philosophy. But what was so interesting about this book is that he has produced a work that is really in the self-help and development category. This is really a book for anyone interested in leadership and some of the big questions that are raised by anyone seeking to rule and enact their agenda. So I really recommend you take a listen to this conversation, but also check out the book as well. Hope you all enjoy the conversation and a huge thank you to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. Jeffrey Rosen, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's start chatting about your book, The Founding Fathers, and of course, I almost said Founding Farmers. I spent way too much time oh. in Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> people who know the area would get the reference there, but Founding yeah. Fathers. So here's the first question. When you just open the book and you're looking at the different chapters and the different Founding Fathers that you're profiling, the thing that immediately sticks out, despite whatever controversies we could have about hypocrisy and slavery and all the big issues, just such an incredible roster of talent. And I kind of struggle to think of comparable eras in American history where you just had this real combination of, of leaders and thinkers and doers. What produced that? beyond just the revolutionary moment itself? Because obviously, and we're discussing this here, they were thinking about these topics well before 1776. It is amazing, isn't it? And what produced the roster was their education, was the books they read. What's so remarkable and so inspiring is that the table of contents includes not just well-known founding fathers like Madison and Jefferson and, and Hamilton and Washington, but people like Phyllis Wheatley, the first great African woman poet, and Abigail Adams, and Mercy Otis Warren, and lesser known uh, founders like James Wilson and George Mason. And all of them read the same books. And that's what was so exciting to me about this project. I'd never read these works of moral philosophy before. And reading them changed my life and also gave me a window into the minds of the founding generation I hadn't had before. So let's talk about reading them, because as everyone knows, despite this being a book podcast, um, people don't read as much as they used to read, let alone in the founding fathers, um, but not just fathers, but in the founding era. I guess the question would be, to what degree do you think leadership struggles in present are actually due to the fact that almost certainly rising generations and present generations are probably the least well-read of any epic in American history? If I had to pick a single cause of our current vexations, it would be exactly that. The fact that people are not reading anymore, and they're certainly not reading with the depth and breadth that they did in the founding era. As you said, there's much to criticize about the hypocrisy of many of the founders. They fell short of many of their ideals. But one thing they kept up until their dying days was their incredible industry in reading books. And it's just so moving to see Adams and Jefferson excitedly trading accounts of the latest translation of the Bhagavad Gita that they've just gotten from Paris and think of Abe Lincoln struggling to pay for a book that he'd left out in the rain. And we have access to all of the books of the entire world, but we're not just reading them. And it blows my mind that I was able to 
read all of these unbelievably inspiring books just sitting at home, either with free editions online or with the actual copies that the founders read if I wanted to read their marginalia. It's just out there shining, waiting, uh, free for the taking. All we need is the self-discipline to read it. So before I get a question to you about the origins of this project in 2020, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on different formats for consuming information. So you could definitely turn this book into a masterclass or a YouTube video or a podcast series or all these different ways that you kind of find ways to speak to the next generation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is lost or maybe even gained if we think of absorbing these ideas in different formats versus actually sitting down and doing the reading? It's really important to read or listen. Um, audi Audible is just as great a way of absorbing text as printed words, but you need to take the time to absorb the primary sources. And I spent a year during COVID just reading all these books I'd never read before. And it took some time and it wasn't with anything in particular in mind. I wasn't setting out to write a book about this project. I just felt that this was a gap in my education. I've had a wonderful liberal arts education, but I never read these books and just needed to read them and see where it led. And it's different than videos and it's different than short form content. It's the it's the difference between information and knowledge, between immediate and delayed gratification. You've got to just take some time with it and puzzle it through yourself and see what conclusions are presented to your reasoning mind, to use that wonderful enlightenment image. And that's the best way to learn and grow. So why did you choose to explore the topic of how the Greeks and Romans inspired the founders' thoughts on the category of the pursuit of happiness? Because I imagine, especially in 2020, you could have written 15 different versions of here's how the Greeks and Romans inspired the founders' thoughts on tyranny, on dispute resolution, on X and Y and Z. Why the pursuit of happiness as the one you decided to explore? It really was a serendipity. I started off with Ben Franklin's project to achieve moral perfection and making a list of 13 virtues where he tried to live up to them by putting X marks where he'd fallen short. I knew about this project because I tried it with a friend a couple of years ago, a rabbi at our synagogue recommended the Hebrew version of Franklin's 13 virtues. And we kind of kept tabs on our behavior for a couple of weeks. And like Fran Franklin, we found it really depressing. So we, we gave it up, <laughs> but we're, we're interested by it. But um, during COVID, I noticed that Franklin had a ep epigraph for his project from a book by Cicero that I'd never heard of called The Tusculan Disputations. And it said, without happiness, or rather without virtue, happiness cannot be. And then a few weeks later, I was I came across a similar list by Jefferson of 12 virtues that he'd sent to his granddaughters. I actually saw it in a on a poster in the Boar's Head Inn in Charlottesville, Virginia, next to the University of Virginia. I was struck that Jefferson's virtues are like Franklin's. And then that he also, whenever anyone asked him about the meaning of happiness, would hand out uh, a quotation from that book I'd never heard of by Cicero, The Tusculan Disputations, which essentially said that happiness is tranquility of mind, self-mastery, and virtuous self-improvement. That's the tranquil man of whom we're in quest. That's the happy man. So basically, I was just, I, I felt intrigued by the fact that I never heard of this Cicero book that was so important to Franklin and Jefferson. And I set out to read it. And then I decided to read other books that shaped the founder's conception of the pursuit of happiness, but what to read. And, and here it was coming across a reading list that Jefferson would send out to the sons of kids who were going to law school or to people who asked him about happiness. And it was there was a section called Natural Religion or Ethics. And at the top of this section is the Cicero book, plus a bunch of other philosophers, uh, Stoics like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus and Enlightenment philosophers like John Locke and Hutchison and Francis Perlamaki. Really, what, what moved me to read the books was I felt struck that this was just a gap in my education. I, I mentioned I've had this wonderful liberal arts education. I've studied, I was an English major in college and I've also studied politics and history and philosophy, political philosophy and law, but I'd never read these books of moral philosophy and I kind of felt like I should just to because they were really important to the to, to the founders. 
And that's why I set out during COVID to read through Thomas Jefferson's reading list. What I read came as a revelation. It changed the way I think about the pursuit of happiness and, and personal self-government and political self-government. And that's how the whole project started. Could you explain what a couple of these terms mean? So I think folks probably, unless they're kind of read into the space, will not know what moral philosophy is. You're referring to self-governance. Like, What are the sort of the ideas that you're kind of referring to here? Absolutely. It's really striking, isn't it? This was all unfamiliar to me too. This used to be at the core curriculum of middle school, high school, college kids and law students, really through, through the 1950s, but it just fell out of the curriculum. So I didn't know about it either. Moral philosophy means how to live. And in particular, like we would call it today a kind of uh, political psychology. It's, it's how to um, achieve happiness. And it's all within the framework of Aristotle's definition of happiness as an activity of the soul in uh, in, 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 align, in in alignment with excellence or virtue. And that sounds confusing to us because what, 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 what does virtue mean? But essentially, uh, the classical philosophers, uh, starting not with Aristotle, but with Pythagoras of all people, who invented not only the triangle and the tonal system of harmony, but also our current framework for moral philosophy, basically said that to achieve happiness is not about feeling good, but being good, not about pursuing pleasure, but about pursuing virtue. And they defined virtue in a particular way, essentially as self-mastery, self-reliance, self-improvement, having a good character. And then they defined having a good character in a particular way too. Uh, they used phrases like reason and passion and drawing on Pythagoras and Plato, uh, they, by which I mean the classical philosophers and also the Enlightenment generation, thinks we have certain faculties of mind with reason in the head, passion or emotion in the heart and desire in the stomach. And in order to be have a good character, we have to use our powers of reason to moderate or temper our emotions or passions so that we can achieve the calm tranquility of mind that's necessary for being our best self and serving others. And when we have the align the the, uh, our, the constitutions of our minds in harmony, we've achieved personal self government, and that personal self government is necessary to have the constitution of the state in harmony, so we can achieve political self government. Uh, so that that's the gist of it. It's basically moral philosophy is how to be a good person. They thought the way to be a good person is to achieve this kind of emotional self control and self mastery. And they thought that that emotional self-mastery and self-control was necessary for habits. So something I'm curious about then, to your point around this starting to fall out um, in the 1950s from the curriculum, this gets into, you know, early 1990s, like culture debates around, you know, old dead white men. So you're not just going back to the founding generation, you're actually going back to the Greeks and the Romans. So some of the oldest, deadest white men in this category. Mm. Um, it's been, you know, 30 years since those debates over the curriculum and like Western civilization. I'm kind of curious where you think as someone who's running up the space, we've just sort of ended up as a society in terms of like, I'm sure there are other, obviously like, in the East, in other parts of Europe, in like Latin America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are other philosophers. Um, how do you think we've kind of come to an accord in like academia or K-12 around like what the real curriculum could look like, recognizing that we didn't have to throw out, you know, this baby of this thought with the bathwater and we kind of tried to reconcile a more diversifying society with that? Absolutely. Such a crucially important question. The first thing to say is this is not Western philosophy alone by any means. Uh, it is the core wisdom of all of the great wisdom traditions, including those of the East. Um, John Adams is so excited to learn that Pythagoras was said to have studied with the Hindu masters and read the Vedas. And in fact, the core wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita and the Dhammapada, namely, we are what we think, life is shaped by the mind, and by uh, focusing on controlling the only thing we can control, namely our own thoughts and actions, we can achieve calm tranquility. This is as much an inheritance of the East and uh, is, as it is of the West. And for what it's worth, I, I got as much of the wisdom and in fact resonated really strongly with the Bhagavad Gita in particular and the, and the Dhammapada, which expressed this core wisdom. Uh, so, uh, in addition, the, the, the basic wisdom, which is that 
emotional self-control leads to happiness has now been embraced by non-white male uh, traditions, including cognitive behavior therapy, uh, notions of emotional intelligence, and in fact, the, the founder of cognitive behavior ther therapy cited the ancient Stoics, as well as the Eastern traditions, as the source of the wisdom. So th there's a 21st century consensus that this kind of balance and control and, and self-discipline is key to happiness. Um, but it's uh, so then there's no need to associate it with the dead white guys in order to live by it. The other thing is that it's not just dead white guys, but the greatest women and people of color in American history all have resonated to this wisdom. We, we talked about Phyllis Wheatley, who wrote poems of virtue inspired by her readings of the classics, Abigail Adams, who is constantly emphasizing the wisdom. Um, Frederick Douglass, who centrally gives a speech called self-discipline after the Civil War, all inspired by these classics that he read in a book called The Columbian Orator um, and other uh, great uh, people of all backgrounds um, throughout time. So it's really important to emphasize this is not the particularized version of a particular a uh, group of dead white guys, but the universal wisdom and truth of the ages. Now, why it fell out is a complicated question. Whether or not the wisdom could be brought back is a really interesting question. We, I can share it if, if you're yeah, if you'd like some some thoughts that uh, I have on that score. Uh, um, and 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 here they are. Um, it's it, it, it the the reason it's meaningful to study these texts is because they're so inspiring and so true. And um, just speaking personally, I'll say, I remember in the 1980s, I was in college and I was yearning for this kind of advice. It was the greed is good decade, you know, hedonism and materialism are celebrated by popular culture. I'm studying the Puritans and I'm kind of unconvinced by the rigors of Puritan theology, but I'm looking for some kind of framework about how to lead a good life and wondered whether that answer could be provided by reason rather than revelation, by a kind of reflection rather than blind faith. And I didn't realize because all this wisdom had fallen out of the curriculum is this is exactly the question the classical moral philosophers set out to answer. And it's extremely uh, inspiring, uh, regardless of whether you have faith or no faith, whether you uh, are operating within a spiritual tradition or not to be guided by this very practical advice about how to use your time well, how to get rid of anxiety, how to achieve mindfulness and focus so you can be productive. And there's a reason that it was so central to the curriculum. So what to do about it? Well, of course, I, I'm really enthusiastic, as you can tell, to talk about these ideas. The National Constitution Center, where I work, is uh, exploring Putting a course online, as you, as you mentioned, it can be podcasts and videos. Most important, links to the primary text, because the whole thing turns on whether or not folks are inspired to learn from the text by reading them. And then we're also exploring collaborations with other scholars who are reading and writing in, in this tradition. There's a, a brilliant uh, scholar at UVA, uh, Angel Parham, who has a course on the black intellectual tradition and the classics. And she explores how these same texts inspired David Walker, uh, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, and other less known figures throughout American history. So just basically studying American history through the lens of this tradition might be an inspiring way of bringing it back into the curriculum. You know, something I'd like your kind of personal advice, but also advice to listeners on is I really enjoyed the chapter on, on Jefferson and, and industry and talking about his, his reading schedule that he's recommending. And I, I really, if, if I could go back in time, uh, okay, I would give myself other advice other than justice, but if I, in this category, this conversation, if I could go back in time um, to 18 year old Marshall in college, I would love to like give that chapter to myself because to your point, you know, Jefferson has a lot of leisure time. Why does he have leisure time? Well, it's because they're slaves. But at a broad level, thanks to the wonders of the modern economy and the higher education system, a lot of us young people had the opportunity to read 
and sit. I had Wednesdays off. I could have actually done his like rigorous reading schedule in ways that interested me. Um, so I guess the real question for you then is in the modern era, how would you suggest people kind of think through the opportunities they have to take advantage of this? Because I think something that my higher education definitely failed to do was kind of instill me with like, I know that you're bummed out to take this course, but you need this course to get your credential. It's like, no, like this is a four-year period of your life where you actually can just sit and read and learn. That's going to advance your life and your career and happiness in all these different ways. How do you suggest we help instill people in that? Um, Because I'm in my early 30s now. I still have enough time to catch up on that. But I think there's a lot of people who are 18 and under who would love to hear that. Completely. Absolutely. We need models. We have to be inspired by people who have just used every moment of the day for productive work and, and what the Greeks would call leisure rather than browsing and surfing. So behind me on the Zoom is one of one of my heroes, Louis Brandeis, great Supreme Court justice. Brandeis's heroes are Jefferson and Pericles. And he thinks that fifth century Athens is the apotheosis of civilization because it was then that people used their leisure to become perfect citizens in a perfect state. And he was so excited to learn that the Greek word for leisure was unemployment or a scholai. He said, what a happy land that. And it, inspired by uh, Pericles and Pythagoras, Brandeis was incredibly uh, focused with his time and was astonishingly productive and wrote the greatest free speech opinions and privacy opinions of the 20th century and was just amazingly productive. So in particular, I I was inspired by all of these incredibly productive people, but beginning with Pythagoras. And again, I didn't realize that Pythagoras invented not only the tri triangle, but he was a kind of uh, mythic figure who lived on the Isle of Croton. And he instructed his disciples first to be good and then like a god. And the way that you could be like a god was to try to achieve perfection through efficient time management and very careful moderation of eating and drinking and exercise. And his disciples would live on this island and they would get up early and they would use their time for music and reading and invention and creative work and, and, and leisure. And as a result, they lived by Pythagoras's injunction, which was reverence thyself. Just to be really concrete about it, seeing the daily schedules of folks like Pythagoras and Jefferson and Hamilton, who would write a schedule to his son saying, you know, here's what you should get, get up at before sunrise, uh, read this from, uh, you know, before until lunch, read English and law and after lunch, read this and that and then to bed. Um, and, and seeing uh, and Franklin, of course, with his charts and schedules, realizing that this kind of virtuous self mastery, it's, it's more a practice. It's a series of habits. It's not resolutions or anything mm -hmm. metaphysical. It's just the actually getting a schedule and sticking to it. I found in writing this book is really unusual, kind of transform, you know, the way I start my day, get, get up before sunrise, uh, read from the ancient literature, watch the sunrise. And then as I said in the book, I found myself writing these sonnets to sum up the wisdom. Very unusual practice to say the least, but it was I was kind of moved to do it. It sounds like a lot of People in the founding era who read this stuff also wrote poems and sonnets, but it was more just the habit. I, I had to get up. I had to do my reading and, I, you know, just to kind of finish off the morning after the sunrise, I would write this sonnet. And there's something so satisfying about how much you can learn by doing that, that I've tried to keep it up. And I'm now not reading, I'm writing another book now, but just have this new schedule of getting up before sunrise, uh, uh, w watching the sunrise, not not writing sonnets now, but the main thing is the um, not surfing or browsing. My my rule now is no email or browsing until after sunrise when I've done my reading, and that simple life hack just kind of keeps you focused. And also, when you're not doing that every day, you feel like you've kind of not fulfilled your potential, like you haven't been as productive uh, as you might have been, and therefore get back in the saddle the next day. So it's it's a long answer to a really important question. And, and my basic answer to your college self is the same one to my college self, because I wish I wish I had these examples too, is we, we get expired, inspired by examples and just seeing how much people are capable of with mm -hmm. habits of virtue is incredible. I um, 
play the piano. I took I studied as a kid. I took it up again as an adult. And I remember once saying to my teacher, you know, I could never play that piece. It's too hard. And he said, you have no idea what you're capable of if you apply yourself to practicing. And there's something so true about that. And that's really the gist of the ancient wisdom that with focus and mindfulness and discipline, we can achieve potentials we didn't even imagine that we had. You know, I think what's so motivation what you just said is it kind of helps reframe i think how we all see our potential so for example uh one of my favorite openings of a work of biography of all time is how um edmund morris opens uh the rise of theodore rosa it has this this great first chapter of um, i think it's uh new year's day um or yeah it's new year's day after he's won re-election um so basically peak theodore rosa it goes through his entire day the last time you ever had the white house open where people would just come in he shakes the record number of human uh hands and you know, two hour period uh, and then he goes to bed and like literally just like reads a book and i think when i read that or well, when i listened to that back in college because my reading capacity wasn't really there yet. I just kind of saw it. Oh yeah. Wow. Like look at this incredible person. Look at Theodore Roosevelt, body, 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 body. This is one of those superhuman feats of strength that we should just consign to the past. But I think because we're focused on reading here, this is just something you can do. Um, I just sort of realized eventually, like I woke up this morning, just read for an hour. Um, that you can just do that. And I think that's what's so exciting about reading in contrast to most. You, you said something so helpful. You said this is a practice. It's not just like a resolution of like, I resolve to be the strongest, fittest 30 something in Austin, Texas, where I live. It's actually just, hey, like, I have a practice. If I wake up, I put my phone away and I just read for an hour. And that's actually it. So it's just, it's just so helpful to put that in concrete terms of what you're trying to actually do here. Marshall, that's so exciting that you were inspired by the amazing Edmund Morris biography, which I was too. And I suddenly started to think about other examples of great biographies of great readers. Think of the David McCullough biography of Truman, who's reading ancient history to try to think through whether or not to drop the bomb in Hiroshima and what to make of the moral decision afterward and taking notes in the margins. Or think of Hugo Black. There's a great biography of Hugo Black. Um, where he would, the Supreme Court justice would fall asleep reading and the light bulb burnt a, a hole in the pillowcase because because he left it on falling asleep. And these are people of the, the height of their power, Supreme Court justice, president of the United States, voracious readers, keeping up the habits and practice that they had from childhood. And I'll just say this again, because it's so great that you're doing this reading program. I can't believe I, I did this project. I mean, I I never read these books before, but to actually read them and try to make sense of them and and then write about them, and then again, it just it blows my mind that it's it's all just free and online. And I do I do read on Kindle, and it's fine to use screens as long as you don't use the screens to do anything else aside from reading. And it and when I was a kid, as I mentioned in the book, I went with my mom to the Library of Congress and the Thomas Jefferson Building. I think is the most perhaps the most beautiful building in all of DC. And I remember, you know, really young, just being filled with wonder at the thought that all the books in the world were in this one building. And now I'm just carrying them around in my pocket on my iPhone. And it's just extraordinary. It's so exciting. And, and there's so much to learn. And you can, you know, just keep getting new books and learning more. All we need is the discipline, the practice. And goodness knows, we, as you said, we have the leisure time everyone can spare an hour. Think of all the time we waste with our browsing and surfing, the time I waste. So it's it's a very, I, I have to say that out of all, I know you're exploring these questions of polarization and our, our very challenging politics right now. If there's any ground for optimism, it's the fact that the books are all available. And if we can just find examples of inspiring readers, like the ones we're talking about, then you and I and even more meaningfully kids now, maybe someone who's listening to us who's in high school or some middle school kid or, you know, dreaming of a better world. They'll be inspired to read too, and they will change the world as a result. You know, I'd like to talk about uh, Harry Truman. I just did a, a really great book that I recommend. It's called The Trials of Harry S. Truman came out in 2022. I think in many ways, the the you know especially the 1948 period is really resonant of today. So I recommend people spend some time reading about Harry Truman. But um, 
it's funny that you brought up his like autodidactical reading habits because something that comes through when you're talking to policymakers and other figures of the era is that because Harry Truman didn't go to college, he's the last president to not go to college. Um, he was so well read, but also like he did, he kind of had that problem that autodidacts have, which is that they like construct all of these theories and they kind of like put it all together. So he's referencing history and people hadn't quite thought of it that same way. So I'm just curious, like what your thoughts are on a leader like Harry Truman, like not going to college, but also, and also like Abraham Lincoln's in this category too. Like you just have these examples in our history of leaders who don't go through these systems, but have within them some urge to kind of pursue that. I just want to hear your thoughts on that. It's so extraordinary. Arguably our greatest presidents and justices have been autodidacts. The ones you mentioned, Truman and Lincoln, uh, uh, Hugo Black, who was looked down on by his snooty Harvard colleagues. Uh, and my goodness, think of the greatest autodidact of all of American history, Frederick Douglass. And it just, Sorry, can we define auto? I, 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 I entered it. Could you define autodidact? <laughs> so, sure. Self, Self-taught, someone who teaches themselves, uh, not going to university, but just teaches themselves by, by reading, by picking up books. And Frederick Douglass is the most devastating moment of his enslavement is when his master's wife, his mistress, first starts teaching him how to read. And then she's forbidden to do that by the evil master. And Douglas feels like a new enslavement has taken place and the liberation of his mind is threatened. And he cobbles together pieces of bread and goes onto the streets of Baltimore and buy, and pays boys on the streets of Baltimore to teach him how to read and pays them with bread for this book, The Columbian Orator, which changes his life. I mean, it just... If you need a, a better testament to the power of reading, you can't get it. And also the fact that this is available to any reasoning mind with remarkable self-discipline. Not all of us will have the gifts of Frederick Douglass or Abraham Lincoln, but you do not need a, a, a fancy education. You need the self-discipline to read. And and it and and it can be any topics. Uh, it's really empowering. I, I hope listeners will be inspired to realize that anything is possible. Moral philosophy, political philosophy, science um, is all accessible to us. All we need to do is take the time to read. You know, speaking of taking the time to read, I'm recording uh, a different episode later today that's entirely not related to this topic. It's on the state and future of the US Navy. And I was just kind of thinking, Okay, so we want to read more. We have all these different challenges that we're facing, especially at a generational transition level. Um, this book that I'm also reading, obviously, is focused on the topic of moral philosophy. The book around the Navy is focused on, do we need a 450 ship Navy? Do we need like a 540 ship Navy? And then going through all these like different categories. So like the height of like practicality, which really matters in the context of Yemen and the context of like the South China Sea and Taiwan, I'm drawn to both these categories, but it literally feels like one has to choose. Um, to the degree that that isn't true, because it's obviously not true, it's a false dichotomy. How do you suggest someone who's ambitious, is smart, is trying to like self-teach themselves these things? What does like a what does a good mix of topics or focus areas look at? I mean, it's something you reference here in the book too that these founders are focused on. They're reading about science. I don't read about science. I don't have time to read about science. Um, I want to do the Oppenheimer biography because it was a broader topic, but I'm not reading um, Enrico Fermi's thoughts on nuclear physics in the way that I think you would imagine a Thomas Jefferson or Adams would have. So, just how would you recommend someone construct like a useful leadership, but also living your life well curriculum? Gosh, well, I mean, I guess I would start with the founder's reading list just because they thought so deeply about this. And what's so striking is how much more on those reading lists that I haven't read. And again, I, I mean, I've really had the incredible privilege of having a great education, but there are whole sections on science, um, on uh, astronomy, and even on ancient history that I haven't read. I read the moral philosophy, but after finishing this book, I thought I really should read Tacitus and Germanicus and all the you know great ancient historians who Jefferson said reading Tacitus was more meaningful than reading newspapers. It was his favorite of all writers. I have to confess, I found the um, ancient history a little tougher going. There's a lot of battles of you know against the Goths and the, the, the ancient Celts. I, I, I want to keep it up. But what I'm suggesting is 
that um, we should set our sights high. All of us reader, you know, anyone who's listening to this podcast is drawn to books and wants to be part of the self-taught republic of reason, which I think is open to all who, who want to join, um, and realize that there's we know so little and there's no resting point and there's always more to learn. I, I still have to re get through that ancient history, push to read the science. I'm like you, you know, I always assumed it was either too hard or that I didn't have time and just constantly be stretching the boundaries of our imagination in order to align with the truth and, and the feeling that this is not just an opportunity, but a responsibility, a duty, the founders would call it. And that by doing this, by getting outside of ourselves and, and seeking the truth, we're really fulfilling our greatest potential as human beings. And perhaps even if you conceive of it this way, aligning with the divine harmonies and truths of the universe. So, you know, again, I could, I'm not going to presume to construct a reading list. The, the Jefferson one is, is really good just because it's so broad. Um, Franklin did did a similar list, but let's all of us together set our sights high and just keep stretching ourselves into new categories. So there are a lot of lists in this book, obviously. Uh, and for a lot of folks, this, this isn't people I think struggle to read modern things. This is definitely <laughs> much older than that. Um, is there any book that comes to mind separate from just the list that you'd recommend that a excited listener like pick up after this, that's going to be the right balance of challenging as this work should be, but also isn't going to like strain your, you know, TikTok adult attention too much. Well, for the best introduction to the moral philosophy, Marcus Aurelius is the best way to go. Many folks have found him the most accessible Roman emperor, um, as well as a great Stoic philosopher in his spare time. It's really accessible. There are modern translations that read like advice books and is just a great way to go. Um, I have a top 10 list at the end, including Seneca's essays uh, are very short and snappy. And we have put some of these texts online at the National Constitution Center in a, something we call the Founders Library. So if you want shorter excerpts, that's a great way to go. Um, but I think if you really want to be inspired into the the reading path, the way you and I are, um, Marshall, I would say a great biography of uh, is a is a really good way to go because there's something about particularizing all these lessons in the way people actually live that's so great. And then we're just off and running with some of the ones you've just recommended: the Edmund Morris on Theodore Roosevelt, or goodness, is McCullough on Truman. I think is just one of the great books of all time it's so inspiring or isaac stone on franklin or take your mm -hmm. take your pick you know so getting to the more political side of this I'm in this last section i'm something i'm sure you've noticed this um i spent a lot of time in my early 20s on like the dc center right uh to conserve in in this dc center right to conservative space and there are just to the conservative listeners there are literally like tens and tens and tens of programs that will give you um, the literal curriculum that we're describing here. They will not only like give you a course, but they'll literally like pay for you to do the course. And you could have, um, you could hang out at George Washington University's housing. Like I'll, I'll put some links to these programs in the, in the show notes because um, it's very interesting. These are very well-run programs, but they're definitely like center right to conservative. I'm curious whether you've noticed, and I also know like at a found, at a funding level, there are right of center, right to conservative donors who are interested in funding these projects. I don't see said anything uh, similar on the center left to left, even among categories of people on the left who are interested in these topics of democracy and Trumpist tensions on the systems. I'm kind of curious, because um, I have my own theories, like what what, what have you encountered that uh, has helped you understand that Clear. Basically, I do not have a way of recommending center-left listeners a way to spend their sophomore year of college summer in D.C. getting paid to read serious books to some of the smartest kids they'll ever meet. Why does this dichotomy exist? Because these ideas aren't political. Because this isn't political. There's there's nothing in here that has to be like left, right, center, et cetera, et cetera. What explains the dichotomy? It's such an important question. You're absolutely right uh, about the dichotomy, and it's. One that the National Constitution Center grapples with, because we have this really important, inspiring mandate to be nonpartisan. 
uh, the only institution in America, as I always recite at the beginning of our programs, charted by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Why is it that the center left has tended to focus more on voter participation and engagement being the goal of civics and the center right more on the substance of teaching civic very well, that, that's so well that that's it that's exactly that, that that that's it exactly that's the dichotomy yeah you know you know the fact that i'm i'm pausing obviously suggests i don't have the answer and i think that answer is different it, it may be related to the question of why the moral philosophy fell out of the curriculum in the 50s. So let me try to answer that, which I don't have a really uh, firm answer to. Descriptively, we know that it was in the 60s that the notion of happiness changed from being good to feeling good, pursuing pleasure rather than virtue, let it all hang out, you do you, the me decade, you know, the kind of uh, effulgence of autonomy that Christopher Lash's culture of narcissism and Tom Wolfe's the me decade was a response to. And it was considered a, a conservative cultural response to the so-called excesses of the 60s that gave it a political balance. Uh, James Davidson Hunter, the author of The Death of Character, also blames Freud uh, for having changed the notion of character to one based on personality. Others have been, uh, blamed the structuralist, uh, post-structuralist turn uh, away from liberal individualism toward blaming society and, and, and identitarianism. And then there's the role of religion and the fact that the Supreme Court appropriately uh, said that you can't teach religion in the classroom, that those decisions were correct, but it made it more controversial even to teach sources that had a, a religious valence uh, from a non-religious perspective. Uh, these are just some important cultural shifts that have tended to have a political valence. And maybe that goes away toward explaining the fact that once the moral philosophy fell out of the curriculum for the reasons I've described, the idea of resurrecting it came to be associated with uh, values that were associated with the right. But it's very important not to allow values like self-discipline and self-reliance and reading to be the property of one side or another in the culture wars. There's nothing conservative or liberal about, about being your best self as great liberals from Frederick Douglass uh, to Ruth Bader Ginsburg show. I, you know, I haven't quite to, uh, exactly answered it, but I think that, that's some of it. And then, and then there's also just a happenstance to the fact that uh, on the center right, Getting out the vote is at the moment associated with liberal outcomes, but that's just a coincidence of the past couple elections. It's just not true that a higher voter turnout should and has favored one party over another historically. Um, so that's just a contingency that uh, is part of it. And I think there also finally, to, to, to bring this home, was a kind of existential debate about civics for what? Even the idea of creating good citizens came to be seen as old fashioned. And, and therefore with the content taken out of civics, people s seem to feel, well, it's gotta just mean you have to be engaged. It has to increase participation, a, a very Jeffersonian rather than Hamiltonian goal. Uh, and what we lost is that for the founders, being a good person was necessary for being a good citizen. And, and again, being a good person doesn't mean practicing traditional morality. These aren't the Christian virtues of faith, hope, and charity that the founders are arguing for. They're the classical virtues of prudence, fortitude, temperance, courage, not going crazy on Twitter and wasting your time attacking other people um, rather than achieving the calm balance that you actually need to listen to someone else so that you might change your mind and you can engage in civic friendship and deliberation. These are these are Madisonian goals, not associated with the left or the right, and they're necessary for the Republic to survive. Yeah, and I think there's, and I feel like this is starting to change, especially given the set of um, very active political questions that I'm going to close this episode on with this next question on. But I think for a lot of folks, the whole civics category just read as very like 1950s and Eisenhower era-y. 
um, you know, I kind of, I even say that out loud and I have an image of a bunch of students in a, you know, classroom pledging allegiance to the flag and it's black and white, you know. Um, but I think the current set of political challenges are ones that like civics are actually a very direct response rather than just an inherent thing that just exists. So for the final question, um, your publisher, um, when they sent me the final copy of the book, um, attached a recent piece you wrote um, in the Wall Street Journal um, about, uh, it was a Saturday essay, the Supreme Court's election dilemma. And it's broadly about um, Colorado and Maine's decision to remove Donald Trump from the ballot. I don't want to focus on on that decision. Um, specifically, that's a whole broader episode. But I think there's a theme throughout the essay that I would love for you to close on, which is the tension the court is going to experience, I think, at ever escalating rates moving forward of having to make rulings, but also in their self-conception, not intercede in the political system by doing so. Um, there's a real tension. There's lots of opportunities for hypocrisy. You could argue both sides of this issue. I would love you just to really, and you could explain that through the case of the Colorado and Maine decisions, but I just want you to really introduce that dilemma because I think that dilemma once you think about it deeply, you're like, oh, wait, I can really understand the multiple sides of the issue. And I think it's one that rising generations are going to have to adjudicate. So I'd love for you just to explain this. You put it so well to say that there are, you can argue it either way and there is opportunities for hypocrisy. But at the same time, what we're learning is that the court's nonpartisan legitimacy is important, that in an extraordinarily polarized system, it's urgently important for there to be an institution of government, namely the judiciary, that seem to be above politics. And the court has been sensitive to that dynamic historically by recognizing this doctrine called the political question doctrine, where it's tried to stay out of controversies that it thinks are best adjudicated by the other branches, um, beginning with the uh, refusal to decide who won the legitimate election in Rhode Island in the 1840s after Dora's rebellion. Obviously, the court today, as you suggest, is as polarized as every other institution of society, and um, its nonpartisan legitimacy is very much under threat. And therefore, some will find it uh, rich or too late for conservative justices who at the moment have the majority to be concerned about legitimacy in the election cases where they lacked a similar concern in, in cases like uh, Dobbs overturning Roe v. Wade. And generally, Chief, although Chief Justice Roberts's project has been to maintain the nonpartisan legitimacy of the court, his conservative colleagues have tended to put doctrinal or ideological purity over institutional legitimacy. And now suddenly they're discovering the cost of that decision. This is not just a dilemma for the court, but of all the institutions of government, this is an extraordinarily challenging time for American institutions. And at a time when all of them are being tested and have lost nonpartisan legitimacy, it makes the need for the rule of law all the more important. And maybe you asked me to bring it home so that maybe that's not a bad place to to do it, we, we think about the core values of constitutionalism, separation of powers, federalism, and the rule of law, which just rests on independent judges who have the confidence of citizens um, uh, having justly won their, their faith that they're going to decide based on reason rather than passion, a system based on reason and conviction rather than force or violence as Hamilton put it in Federalist One. He said it was an experiment, and the American experiment was a test of whether citizens could govern themselves by reason and conviction, not force or violence. We're now undergoing the greatest test that we've experienced since the Civil War in terms of our separationist and secessionist urges and trends. And if there's any cause for hope, it's the inspiration we can take from history at these moments of crisis. It's been great inspiring leaders like Lincoln, like King, like the founders at their best, who have summoned the better angels of our nature and led us to converge around the shared ideals of the Declaration and the Constitution. Jeffrey, thank you so much. This has been really great. The book is The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspire the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. And can you just really quickly um, shout out the National Constitution Center specifically for folks who want to learn more about your work there? Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Friends, check out constitutioncenter.org. 
it is, it'll blow your mind how exciting these resources are. Our interactive constitution has received 70 million hits. It's among the most Googled constitutions in the world. And you can find the leading liberal and conservative scholars in America writing about every clause of the constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. Justice Amy Coney Barrett and Neil Katyal with a civil conversation about the habeas corpus clause, multiply that by 80, and it just is extraordinary what the resource is. But that's not all. I'm like a Ginsu Knives salesman. You can check out my We the People podcast, where every week I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative thinkers to talk about the constitutional issues in the week, whether it's Section 3 of the 13th Amendment or Chevron or the meaning of David Hume, which we're going to talk about tonight uh, on our show. Uh, it's it's it, it's just an enclave of light to see really thoughtful people agreeing and respectfully disagreeing, united by a shared commitment to civil discourse. There are classes for kids, a Constitution 101 class that we're pushing out with Khan Academy to hundreds of thousands of high school kids across the country, and primary sources. So you can read the actual text that the founders read and that people throughout American history have expressed and be inspired by them. It's a marvelous institution. It's such an honor to be part of it. And I'm excited that all these great readers who are listening to this show uh, have the opportunity to check us out at constitutioncenter.org. Great. Thank you for, I could, <laughs> I could tell you're a podcaster. That was a very, uh, that, was your, that was your podcaster spiel that you've delivered um, before, but we almost did it. Jeffrey, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you so much.